Chico. <laughs> Chico bye for you. Hey, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome to the first non-on-the-go that gets my goat of the season. Of the year, I should say. I like of the season. Yeah, the season has a better ring to it, but it's kind of, I mean, I don't know when the season starts and ends. This is uh, still winter, if we're talking about that kind of a season. Maybe we're talking about the television season? The football, no, football season's over. Baseball season? It's about to start. Forget it. Not the season. The year. Welcome, everybody. So where where does this fall? After the on the on the goes. All of them? Yeah. This is not timely. It's just talking about a movie that came out ten years ago. Okay. So. Uh, so, anyways, Rish sent me a link the other day via email and said, "Hey, would you like to? How interested would you be to seeing this?" I'm not even speaking English here. Let me try this again. He said, hey, does this film interest you? And I clicked on the link and it took me to the iTunes page, I want to say, of the uh, movie. And the movie was called Dream On Silly Dreamer. And it was a short film uh, that must have gone into some kind of a film festival. What, what? Do you know the story behind the film? I don't. I, I think it would be better to start earlier that uh, you shared with me the soundtrack to Frozen. Which, when we're recording this now, Frozen is still making tons of money. You know, it's, it's on its way to $400 million. When you're listening to this, I, you know, you may have worn out the Blu-ray or the digital download <laughs> by now. Or, you know, it's already on Encore or Stars or BBC America for some reason. Have you ever noticed what weird stuff ends up on BBC America? But it, it, the, there was some kind of excitement everywhere, not just with us, about Frozen, about a new Disney animated film that seems to have captured the hearts and wallets of a lot of people. And so we were talking about it and thinking about the songs, and it made me think about the, the songs to the, the Disney films that were special to me as a young man. So I started going online to read about the bios of some of these people, you know, like Howard Ashman and, and Alan Menken. And, and I stumbled across a documentary that you and I had seen about the Disney Renaissance and how it came about. And then I was surprised to see that there was another documentary, a sort of related documentary that had been made about the fall of the Disney Animation Studio. I had never seen it. It's not available on Netflix or anything like that. And I just barely watched it because you had downloaded it. And yeah. I guess I, now I hit the ball back into your court. You sent me the link and I, I looked at it. And the weird thing was, it's like, here, watch the, the trailer for it. And I clicked on that just to see what the hell is this movie because I've not heard anything about it. And the preview that it gave you was like 30 seconds of the credits from the start of the film. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm just like, what? The, what is this? And then I read the... Uh, you know, the synopsis or whatever. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And then I looked and it was a $1.99 to buy the film. And I thought, yeah, I think I could probably spring for a $1.99. So I just bought it and figured we'd watch it the next time we got together. And so, yeah, we got here. It was already late and I still forced you to sit down. Well, it was not a lengthy watch. Yeah, that's true. Like, I knew How that long was would the case. you say it is? I think it was 40 minutes. But, but the sad thing is. I mean, the whole point of the movie is sadness, but there's not a lot of joy in those 40 minutes. It could, they could have tripled the length of the thing, focusing on the positive, but Before because of the minutes. reason the movie was made, the documentary was made, uh, it's all focusing on the negative. Um, basically, it was put together by some ex-Disney animators after they had been laid off. After the animation studio, the 2D animation studio, the traditional animation studio had been closed down and all of them had been given pink slips. Someone, some, what was his name? Dan Wells? Something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Or Dan Lund. It was something with an L. So this man, uh, Dan Lund, basically just got a, a camera together and, and a microphone, ostensibly a microphone, <laughs> and uh, recorded a few memories from these Disney animators about their time working on the projects during the Disney Renaissance or, or before, and then their feelings about Disney saying, you know, you're all out of a job because 
And, and that was funny. That was something I hadn't heard before. They all blamed it on Ice Age making $47 million its <laughs> opening weekend. Which had happened like the weekend that they were fired. They were all shut down. So obviously it wasn't just that. But that was the, hey, did you guys see how much Ice Age made? Yeah, it made more than you guys make for us, so you're fired. Was basically kind of the the way they put it across to them. But yeah, it was. I found it to be kind of an interesting thing. When you talk about how there wasn't a lot of joy, but they did talk a little bit about how... You know, they would go to work every day. They were like, yeah, oh my gosh, it was so hard. And we would work 12 hours a day, seven days a week and stuff like that. And But none of them really seemed like they were complaining so much about that. They're like, oh yeah, people got divorced, but, you know, they, their families fell apart. And, and, you know, they... My favorite story was a, a woman says, you know, while they were working on Beauty and the Beast, they would work 80-hour weeks or, or longer. They would spend their night at their desks and so they could never do laundry. And she said she would just stop by Kmart and buy more underwear. Because <laughs> she, you know, she could, she didn't have time to wash the clothes that she had. Yeah. But they, the way they talked about it, it wasn't so much that, that they hated that. It was tough and it was strenuous, but they did it and they did it happily because they loved it. They loved what they did, which I think is such an amazing thing to happen anywhere, really, when it comes down to it. Um, and I think somebody mentions that in this film, or in, maybe it was in a different film that I also saw over the weekend about Pixar. But anyways, <laughs> somebody said, you know, find something that you love and do that, and you won't ever work a day in your life. Um, and that's just... I feel like talking a little bit about writing by way of that film just because of that whole idea of you know taking the something that you love and making that you know doing that as a job and it's interesting because you know there's there's I guess degrees of that really doing what you love or doing something that's kind of like what you love you know what I mean like for example my son loves cars he thinks they're so super cool he spends all his days watching Top Gear Really? Yes. Oh. On BBC America. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, on Netflix, actually. But oh. uh, he watches that endlessly. Uh, we got him a model kit for Christmas, and he sat there for hours painting this thing and gluing it together piece by piece. Never done anything like this before. Never. This is his first model he'd ever done. But yeah, I think he had a really good time and is proud of himself for putting this model car together See, i wish he were seven or eight years younger this year mattel put out this hot wheels build a hot wheels set it comes with all the, the the wheels and the axles or whatever and then it comes with the the material whatever it is like a like let's say it's a clay kind of stuff only it's a liquid form or whatever and you can put it in the mold uh -huh. and then you know make whatever kind of car you want whatever color you want you know if you want to mix colors or whatever and swirl it and that and then it bakes it like a like an easy bake oven or something I, well i wanted to say like an easy bake oven but it's more like <laughs> like a when, real oven when we would do shrinky dinks or or uh just yeah one of those things where put the chemicals together and then you let it cook and it hardens maybe it's clay you know you're you're and so kids can out. make their own Hot Wheels cars. Huh. And the, they sell so friggin' many of those Christmas of 2013. And it lit my imagination on fire. I was like, wow, you, that would have been so much fun as a kid to say, okay, I'm going to do a black one. But in the center, I'm going to put red and let's mix it together and see what it makes. And anyhow, I continue to talk about your son. Yeah, like I was saying, he's really into cars. And so if he loves cars so much, obviously there's a lot of different things that you could do. If you love cars and you want to make cars your vocation. I mean, obviously, every town has dozens and dozens of auto mechanic shops. You could be an auto mechanic. You could be a person that designs cars. You could be a person that sells cars. You could be a race car driver. You could be a bus driver. You could be, uh, you know, dozens of different things that have to do with cars. And I'm sure... Depending on who you are and what it is you love about cars, 
one of those things is going to be awesome and you know others of them are going to be like nah it's not exactly what i was really after but it's better than nothing you know kind of a thing kind of like me you know i like you know i went into film and i wound up being a news editor news editing isn't quite the same as film it's not really what i was after but you know it pays the bills and it's a job it it keeps uh food on the table kind of a thing so and it's better than digging ditches or you know some of the more menial things that i could be doing instead at least i'm not throwing out my back every week because of that i'm just sitting on a nice office chair in front of a computer and air-conditioned room although it's a little over air-conditioned i'll have to say it's damn cold in there you should just get fatter i'm trying i'm really trying put your mind to it <laughs> but but yeah it's it, it, that's an interesting thing you know and you and i always talk about how we'd love to be writers and actually do that as for a living do that as a job there's dozens and dozens of things you could do as a writer for a job too and i think only some of them will qualify as what we want to do you know being i could be a writer of the news for example but that wouldn't qualify wouldn't satisfy me that wouldn't make that urge to be a writer you know wouldn't scratch that itch if you know what i'm saying but yeah i saw that film and heard them talking about that and how much they would just love to go into work every day and how how you know how awesome was it you could just go in you could wear whatever you wanted you just walk into your little office you turn on whatever music or book on tape or you know whatever it is that you've got and you just sit there and draw all day long and you know how great of a job that was for them how much they loved it it's something that i'm jealous of because i mean that was something that's the reason why i went into film in the first place you know when i was a kid i had that same idea i'd heard that same kind of a thing you know find something you love and then you'll never you know hate to go to work you'll never work a day you'll play basically is what you'll do for a living and that was the reason why i tried film because i looked at all the kind of things that i like to do which basically storytelling is what i like to do and there are ways to tell a story and i thought okay well i really like putting videos together with my friends and you know trying to make a movie and so i think i'm going to try and do that and that's why i did film as my wasted college <laughs> wasted time in college was uh, in hopes of doing that getting a job that uh, would be something i loved so much that it didn't feel like going to work when i went to work but in many ways what we're doing right now is an outgrowth of that now obviously you and i wouldn't have gotten to know each other if it weren't for film school but also just storytelling and trying to do it in a structured way, the way that we do our show and we assign the parts and you and I have a sense of pacing and maybe it's not exactly the same, but we're usually similar in, oh, there, there needs to be a little bit longer pause there. Okay, well, let's put some music here, sound effects. And granted, we're yeah, we're not exactly the same person, but we have a sense of how stories should be told and how they should flow, and ooh, that one didn't work. And most of the time when you and I are in a room recording and somebody does a line and it's not quite right, we both know it. I think a lot of that has to be an outgrowth of what we studied in school, what we wanted to do with our lives, with storytelling and all that. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are people out there that are geologists and they're just as good of storytellers as we are, just as good of full cast audio fiction podcasters as we are, except for that they, you know, know a lot about rocks. Maybe. But yeah, I think that is kind of uh, why we do this, why we have a hobby is because we don't do for a living what we love so much that we would not uh, feel like we're going to work. So yeah, I guess that's where this show came from, is where we, we didn't feel that satisfaction that we needed in telling stories, and so we found a way to tell stories uh, that we could. Um, if we had been broadcasting majors, we might still be sitting right here doing this exact same thing, although we'd both have the big clam headphones on, and maybe it would be more technically minded rather than creatively bent, if you know what I'm saying. You're bent. I know that. As you've heard in, in you know, episodes like uh, Sleepless Afternoon or whatever where the sound quality is absolutely awful. 
I d- didn't care so much as long as the performances were good or, you know, the, the story was what I wanted it to be. I hoped that people would forgive the bad sound. And if we had been, you know, radio people or, or whatever the deal, maybe it would be the opposite priority. I don't know. I, I mean, everybody's got their show. Not everybody. But Not it, there everybody. seems to be a lot of podcasters <laughs> out there. And they have priorities. They have things that appeal to them. That, that's the point I'm going to make with my show is this. Mm-hmm. And uh, just let's use Brian Lincoln as an example. Technically, you know, he's he's at the top of his game. He has an idea of how to do something. And if he doesn't know, he figures out a way to do it. And then he shares it with the listeners instead of just keeping it and saying, okay, I figured out how to do this. It's going to make my shows really, really good. He says, look, I'm, I'm going to be teacher here and I'm going to explain how this is done. And this is the process. And this is going to sound like I'm saying he's not entertaining. His priority <laughs> is not to entertain. It's to educate. And that, to me, that's really interesting. To me, it's really telling of who Brian is. Uh, and, you know, maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe he hears this and he's like, I'm not an educator. I just love to hear the sound of my own voice. No, that's me talking again about myself. <laughs> Help me out here. What am I What am I trying to say? No, I, I see what you're trying to say. Yeah, he, that's the point of his show. And that's the point of a lot of shows is sometimes their point is to inform. Sometimes their point is to educate. Sometimes their point is to entertain. And, you know, it depends on the show. And our show is obviously 100% about we're trying to entertain people. And uh, anything else that happens, any education or any uh, other stuff is secondary. It may happen and we're not going to be upset. Maybe we'll enlighten somebody or we'll make them think about something that they hadn't thought about before or something like that. But that's not our main goal. I heard somebody just the other day, I think it was yesterday, say... That if he could make money doing, you know, his podcast, that's what he would do for his job. You know, he would quit his job and just be a podcaster. And, uh, you know, obviously that person was you. <laughs> can we talk about that just for a second? We can if you'd like to. The the the, the folks in uh, Dream On Silly Dreamer were underappreciated, overworked, and sounded like underpaid at first. Right. And then these movies started to make a gazillion dollars. Yeah. They, and they started to be paid a tremendous amount of money. But before all that, that's when they were happy. And that's that seems to be the case always. You know, we didn't know we were so happy when we were poor uh, until we weren't that anymore. We had new worries. We had new stress. Yeah, mo money, mo problem says. Oh, uh, I like that. B I G, not me, but a different B I G ah, once he, said. <laughs> you and I have been doing the Dune Steve. By the time this comes out, we'll probably be on six years, really close to it at least. And that, you know, it's had its ups and downs, and there have been lots of times when it came close to to folding because of stress, because of time, because of Abby Hilton, because of having other kids, <laughs> because of money, because of work. Time constraints. I don't know that there were a ton. There was a ton of friction in between you and me, but you know, there, there just many, many different stumbling blocks and obstacles. And Except for that one time when we read feedback. Have you? Are you two fighting? <laughs> and the, if they didn't see if we're over now, we would look back at that. I would assume, unless it ended because of strife between you and me, we would look back on that time and say, "Oh gosh, do you remember how much fun that way?" We would use that example. Of the time when we were reading the feedback and yelling at each other and your <laughs> wife woke up and came in and knocked on the door and said, are you guys fighting? Which we I've told that story a bunch of times. <laughs> You've told that story before because it was so amusing to us because we were just doing our characters. Uh-huh. Sometimes I, we get carried away. Or I certainly do. I know I raise my voice or I, I, I forget, you know, that's a family show or whatever, despite the explicit warning on every episode. <laughs> But it, you get caught up in this thing, and, and and there were times that, it, yeah, that it was really, really late, and you had to get up early in, in the morning, and you probably felt like crap warmed over the next day. But a week later, you don't remember that. You remember how much fun it was, even though we stayed up till 3.45 or whatever the deal was. And that's how 
the Dune Steve would be in the rearview mirror if it had ended, I think. We'd be like, oh gosh, do you remember that? And do you remember how much fun we had with the, 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 the Canadian Australian accent, you know, that kind of stuff, <laughs> or, or how much difficult we had with that damned uh, submarine story or the, the ship, st- the World War II ship story, you know, just all of that, or, you know, doing, doing this funny voice or trying this at the time we both tried to do the Scottish accents or, or, you know, the British girl and, and the French guy who was hitting on her and just these these were really fun creative times and the only thing that was missing was a paycheck Mm -hmm. and so here we are in 2014 and after going to the new media expo last year and this year they sort of did dangle up the possibility of a paycheck in front of us you know what i mean Uh i mean especially this year because scott sigler was talking about and you probably heard us talk about scott sigler a hundred times because it it was an impactful thing. He was there in our room in Miranda 7 giving his spiel, which he had probably done 10 times before. But a lot of the things he, were saying, he was saying felt like they were applicable to us, to yeah, what we do. They really did. He started doing podcast novels uh, in 2000, I think, five, he said. And you and I started listening to podcasts in 2006 and you did your first podcast in 2007, and maybe it was eight, but I think it was seven. And then we started the Dune Steve in 2008. And it was just all of that newness and excitement and the things he was talking about that he learned and that uh, he was passing on the knowledge. I'm sure the, it was so that everybody in the room could apply it to whatever they were doing. And it felt like we could do that. We could do that and we could make money and we could new media expo the hell out of all of our listeners <laughs> which basically means you know i say hey you like us you like what we do you want us to do more give, give us, us money, money. Give us money. <laughs> i would hate to be one of those people that's endlessly saying give me give money, money give me money, money. Money, money, money but i also would like you know I, I i looked at our stats i think i may have said this on we were sitting together at during the sigler thing or in between the sigler thing and the like the acx thing and you showed me our stats for what was the episode I think it was John John Miro. Miro's uh, Once a Hero. What was it? <laughs> Rhymes with Hero. Uh, his story was... Harlan's Wake. Harlan's Wake, yeah. And my jaw dropped when I saw how many people had downloaded it. Is right. that what it, They the were stat download was? stats. It doesn't show the people who just pushed play, right? I would assume that probably counts as a download, but I don't know if they have to listen to the entire thing or exactly how that works. Um, that's one of those things I don't know. I know that podcasters are supposed to be famously crazy for their stats they're always supposedly checking them and they'll call their provider and say hey my stats haven't been updated in two hours what's going on or yeah. something <laughs> there i was never like that there was a time when i was way more into the stats than i am now i'll have to admit it may have been six months or more since the last time i looked at our stats before we looked at right that and time. it had been like a year and a half or two years since i had looked at the stats and the numbers had gone up so considerably so much that it was like a totally new show for me i was just like whoa you know we were not in the ballpark we had been in before we were suddenly majorly now granted we're not majorly we were in the minors instead of in the the farm team is, <laughs> is that an adequate okay that works is that, is that a good enough sports medicine? sure does that sure. work i think minors and farm team means the same thing but oh, that's okay you bastard. uh we get what you're trying to say uh, but i was just blown away by that and you said you know if if every one of those listeners gave us a dollar a month then we could live. I could. It, it went like this: If everybody gave us a dollar a month, I could quit my job, and have that be my job. If every one of them gave us two dollars a month, then we both could quit and do this as a job. And um, what isn't that a weird thing? I mean, had you been thinking about that, or did that just come to you as a combination of looking at the stats and listening to Scott Sigler? I, it just kind of came to me. I hadn't thought of that before, but uh, yeah, just looking at the numbers and kind of calculating that out, I thought about that. The thing is, there's no way every listener that listens is going to give us a dollar a month. No, it's a free show. It's it's a free show, and that's probably part. You know, a lot of the reason why they listen to it to begin with. But I told you about, and I told it on the air about that movie podcast that I would listen to. 
where it was two guys and they just basically bitch about things that they thought were wrong with the movie industry. And every once in a while they would say, Hey, give us some donations. Uh, you know, keep it, help us keep going. Cause you know, it's, it's hard. And, and you know, each one of these episodes takes X number of hours to do. So if you can give us some donations, that would be great. And then he, the guy came on there and he says, Hey, hey here's how we're doing with donations. And the money was so great that I suddenly was like, Oh, I don't know that I want to listen to these guys. <laughs> um, it, it was a mistake. You don't, you don't want to tell people. It's just like, we don't want to say, you know, 347 people downloaded Lazarus in the tank for some reason, putting a number on it. it there's something, there's a negative reaction to that. I don't know what, what it is, it, it, but I was just, I was bothered but to find out how much money these guys were making in donations. But maybe that's the difference between those guys and me. I, I don't, I, I feel bad asking people for donations. And there are other shows that do donation drives and there are other shows that do, you know, a, a, a set script every week or month or whatever it is of here's how you can donate to the show and this is why we need it. And it may be that that, if we did that every single episode, you know, you and I would only be working weekends or something like that. And the rest of the thing would be doing Steve money. I just, I, I want people to like us <laughs> and it, not like as in Facebook, like I want people to actually enjoy what we're doing. And if I hear that somebody enjoys it, that's my reward. For some reason, I, I, I some switch is not in the right setting in my head where, uh, well, you know, they need to give us money. Then I will be rewarded. I don't know. Should we put out more uh, incentive things that, or, or do more drive? The, the, the money we got for doing the 13 nights of Halloween in 2013 was so great that it enabled us to have a computer that we're recording into right now. Who would have guessed that that would happen? But we got the computer now. I I, <laughs> I, I, I don't dare say, you know, hey, we're, we're going to sit down and review every single one of Uwe Boll's movies. Yeah, if I wouldn't you guys dare will say donate that either. To, to uh, <laughs> our show. We know they're bad, but you want to hear us complain about how bad they are. So please donate to the show. You know what I mean? Other shows do that. And if my cousin is any indication, he listens to a movie review show and they every six months they do a new donation drive and they've produced like six episodes that are just for people that donate. But it's not just donate five dollars. You have to donate like X number of dollars, like a, a, a minimum of at least a shitload of money <laughs> to get to listen to these six episodes. And he does it every time. And it sounds like the other fans of this show do it every time, too. It, should we be doing that? <laughs> well, I was thinking, for one, if we wanted to ever make, you know, be able to quit your job and do this as, as a living. For one thing, I would think it would be something that people that listen to the show would be down for. You know what I mean? Like, if you think about it, you give us a buck a month kind of thing. That's what, 10 bucks a year? I don't know. Maybe you guys don't think we're worth 10 bucks a year, but <laughs> I would be willing to pay 10 bucks a year to see, you know, my favorite show or to listen to my favorite uh, story. You know, you go and you buy a book, you pay 10 bucks for it. You go and you uh, buy a DVD or whatever it is that you do, you pay 10 bucks for it. Just because we're generally free, uh, usually something that's free is free because it gets its money in another way. Like, you know, radio is free to listen to because they have commercials. You know, television is the same kind of way. You can watch anything on ABC or Fox or whatever because they have commercials. We don't do either. We don't have commercials and we don't charge. We just do it as a hobby. But if people found it to be something worthwhile, I would think, you know, we rate, you know, 10, 12 bucks a year. But yeah, I was thinking that it would be cool if we did some subscription drives instead of just donation drives, subscription drives this year so that people sign up to do the five bucks a month or the 10 bucks a month. Because we know that every single person who 
downloads the show is not going to donate. No, no. But if one fifth of those people donated ten bucks, it would be the same as everybody donating one buck, kind of a thing. You know what I mean? So it brings the number down substantially of who has to donate. And I, I was thinking of doing something like that because I don't know. I mean, maybe it's hard to say. Hard for me to be all proud and puff my chest out and say it. But I think we're worth a buck a month for people to listen to us. And that's a buck a month, not a buck a show even. You know, if we're better like we have been than we were last year and get more than one show a month. You know, it's what, 50 cents a show or less? I don't know. I think that we're worth that much. We should be worth that much. I mean, we work on it. It's not like it just does itself. So, um, and, and yes, that's another thing that you and I came out of the new media expo with was let's do more. Let's do, let's work a little harder. Let's try just a little bit harder. And, and granted, it's still early in the year for us, for you guys. How oh, do you remember 2014? <laughs> but we have been really trying hard to get things out on a schedule, to get more things out to farm out more of the work so that we can count on more coming in when you and I aren't doing it ourselves. Gosh, I hope people appreciate that. I hope people notice that 2014 is not like 2013 or 2012. More songs anyways. More songs. You wrote, <laughs> uh, you know, a song parody for an episode today. And I can't remember you doing that before. <laughs> you have? I don't think so. I don't know. So, I've tried to start writing some kind of skit, but they always never finish. I start writing it, and then I don't ever finish it. But you always you write skits no, like no, endlessly. No, no, I don't. They're, they're, I mean, I, I, I write the majority of the ones that we hear, but I've started lots or had ideas for lots that just never – we never did because it's work. Because, again, you, you don't have to. We're just getting together. It's like, why do a song or why do this sketch? And uh, – I hope people appreciate that and they look forward to it. And it's like, oh, somebody saw that there was going to be singing in one of the episodes and they're like, oh, singing, I can't wait. And that makes me smile. It's like, well, really? Okay. I mean, there has to be an anti-announcer man out there. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, let's shelve this just for a second, this this topic about doing the Dune Steve better. We can go back to it at the end of this show if you want. But I, I, I did, I, I know you did. I wanted to talk about the Disney, the rise and fall of the Disney Animation Studio, the the Renaissance, the the rebirth and redeath <laughs> of the the Disney uh -huh. thing. That, did we ever find out what the name of that documentary was? The good, and we by good I mean the the positive documentary that talked about how Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, how those movies came about. The documentary, thank you, was called Waking Sleeping Beauty, and it talks about what Walt Disney had created while he was alive. And then once Walt was gone, the driving force of the Disney company varied. You know what I mean? Sometimes it was, you know, let's try and do what Walt would have done. Other times it was like, well, that was then. Let's, let's focus on movies for teenagers. Let's do, let's do stuff on the cheap. Let's do television. Let's do stuff for tweens. As, as it would fall into different regimes they all had different intentions. But when Jeffrey Katzenberg came in, which was like 85 or so, he had this, this idea of Disney once stood for something. You would say the name Disney and uh, something would come into people's heads. Let's do that again. And they spent tons of money and energy doing theatrical animation again. And, you know, the their first hit was Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And then, you know, it went on with... The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Lion King. This tremendously successful, both in money terms and artistic terms, period, for the Disney company that took it to the heights of, I mean, I, I don't know. I wasn't alive in the 50s or the 40s to know how big a deal the Walt Disney Company was when Walt was alive. But I find it hard to believe that it was a bigger deal in those days than it was in, say, 1991 or 93, when these movies came out and, and the characters 
were beloved and suddenly everybody had a stuffed animal of this person and all the songs, everybody knew the songs and there would be a pop version on the radio and they would win the Oscars and the, people couldn't wait for them to come out on video so they could wear out the tape. And a bunch of the people that were involved in this were interviewed. And anyway, it was just really, really positive. And the one we watched tonight, they take, took a look at maybe why that stopped yeah. being the way it was. And the first thing was that the first excuse they gave was that a bunch of new management came in. Everything started being micromanaged because now there was now there were big money because Lion yeah. King now there were billions of dollars instead of millions of right. dollars. Right. The Lion King made so much money that people were just like, holy crap, th this is possible? And people are, are investing money in films, in animation, and trying to get rich off of this. Whereas before it was, oh, yeah, we just did it for the art of it. And, yeah, and that's, so that's one the of the thing. jokes oh. that they had where they had the... The manager who says, okay, we're going to split you into two different divisions so we can get twice as much product, I, I mean, art, out of you as before. And see, that was really telling. In theory, that's fine. Two teams. Because half of the people that made Beauty and the Beast so great are going on to one team, and the other half are going to another team, and so you will get two Beauty and the Beasts. But I, I think something was glossed over there because that's not what happened. We suddenly had a Disney television animation division that was doing Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin cartoons, daily cartoons kind of thing. And we suddenly had a straight-to-video, cheap sequel yeah. division. That One was of the doing... artists talked about that where they said somebody came and said, Oh, yeah, I didn't like your last movie. And they're like, you didn't? I'm like, yeah, that Aladdin 2 wasn't as good as the first one. And they're like... There's an Aladdin too, and these are the people that work, <laughs> that are the artists. Didn't even know about this because it's done somewhere else, some you know, on the cheap. Let, let's address that for a second. I had no idea that there was a Return of Jafar. I had yet to see Aladdin, and right next to a, the clamshell of Aladdin was the clamshell of Return of Jafar. And as far as I know, this was the first time this had been done. I can't. Can you give an, uh, uh, another example before then? I don't. I don't think. I don't think so. I think there had the ever first. been a cheap quill made, and now that was a 21st century term, cheap quill, because they were done so cheaply and badly. These direct-to-video sequels, but holy cow! Everything, not just the animation or the story or the songs or the voice work for Return of Jafar was inferior, but. It made so much money. And the people who loved Aladdin felt obligated, I think, it's probably a good word to say, to buy Return of Jafar. I, I imagine it wasn't expensive. It was probably twenty four ninety nine retail, and nineteen ninety nine you could get on sale or whatever. But that was that was the first one, the first domino to fall. And uh I'll bet you could name 10 right now Disney cheap quills without even having to look it up or take a breath. <laughs> there were so many of those made. And I'm trying to think. I, I, I thought Bambi 2 was, a, was good. It was a Bambi 2. And I w have been told <laughs> that the third Cinderella was good. Cinderella 2 and a half. There was a two and a half. What was oh well, there was Lion King. Lion one King and one and a half. Two. I think Cinderella three was actually called two and a half or something like that. It was where they had the what if the glass slipper didn't make it? Yeah, you? and and I, I you know I I've been told that that's better than the 1950s Cinderella, and I'm they they may be right, but who wants to take that chance? <laughs> <laughs> there were so many of these. And to my knowledge, they never lost money. How could they? They were done for a dollar. And these things would be in production. Kids in sweatshops before, in Indonesia drew them. Yeah, bef <laughs> but before the theatrical release of, say, Atlantis or Emperor's New Groove, the Atlantis 2 DVD, you know, uh, not DVD, the Atlantis 2 straight-to-video sequel would be in production. The Kronk's New Groove would be in production it was a license to print money. 
for Disney. But, as Jeff Goldblum taught us, just because you can do, do something doesn't mean you should. Yeah, it's only a license to print money for so long. At a certain point, people realize that it's this is not the same. It's not good. It's not worth the small amount of money you pay for it even. But it, they stop. It, it harms the overall product as well. Right. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's a shame that that happened. But, you know, that's going to happen when there's that much money to be, to, to be had. And what happened with the two Disney feature animation companies was we're going to make, not only make one a year, which has in which historically had been impossible. You know, Walt Disney managed to do it like twice in his lifetime, and it nearly bankrupted the company. But not only are we going to do one a year, we're going to do one in the summer and one in the winter. And instead of these movies taking seven, eight, nine years to gestate, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like we got the idea this year. It's got a release date eighteen months from now. Yeah. Yeah, they really rushed it and really started going with the two-a-year thing. And uh, you saw the drop in quality from that, too. It works in theory. It sounds like a great idea. But the things that worked before are suddenly all gone. People are doing it more as a job than as a passion and a love. Because they got to get it done. they got to get it out by this time. They can't spend the time to make it great because... You know, they, they don't have the time to make it great. This one comes out, and then they got to start in on the next one already, a second. That one's done. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's the, the sad thing, the thing that really hit me when I was watching that movie and they started talking about that is, you know, that brought about the down... You don't see feature animation anymore. It went away. Uh, sorry, you don't see 2D feature animation anymore. It's gone. You know, they, they tried a couple of times to revive it. We, we were mentioning Princess and the Frog and that Winnie the Pooh film that came out in, was it 2010? 11, I think. 11. Those two are the last two that we've had. Yeah, I can't and they think were, of any others. They were both fine films, but they weren't given the chance. They still, it seems like, are expecting Lion King numbers out of every film that they get. Lion King made $422 million. In 94 dollars. In 94 dollars. And so that's a lot of money, And but they're still expecting that. They want these movies to compete with, you know, like we mentioned, Ice Age or, or whatever else, all of the computer animations. They want them to be able to compete with those kind of films and get the same kind of money, but they're different and they don't necessarily have to do that. You don't have to give up on a film just because it's not a blockbuster. You know what I mean? There's there's that's, there's that's niches for everything out there. And uh, unfortunately, apparently that's not in Disney's plan anymore. You know, if it's not a blockbuster, then we're not behind it. You know, we're not going to put something in the Sundance Film Festival because that's for crap and tiny films that don't make a lot of money or something like that, you know? But that's not just Disney. That's almost all the studio's attitude. Yeah, that's now. true. And it's so frustrating because every year there are two or three movies like A Paranormal Activity or A Bridesmaids or, you know, something that's a sleeper, they used to say. You know, a movie that people didn't see coming that ended up making a lot of money. It wasn't, a, a, it wasn't supposed to be a blockbuster. It was just, you know, something small that reached a lot of people. Every year there are several of those. Mm -hmm. And yet the studios don't care. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, I don't care. I would rather make one Dark Knight than ten uh, Hangovers. No, I'd rather make one Pirates of the Caribbean 4 than ten Hangovers. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny that, but yeah, they split it up. They diluted their brand. They did all that kind of stuff in attempts, in, in, in the interest of getting more money, milking this animation for all that it was worth um like you know the guy who has the goose that lays the golden egg 
And he's like, oh, well, if I cut this goose open, you will get all the gold out from inside of it. He cuts it open, and it's just a goose. And that's what Disney did. But the thing that really kind of upsets me about it is I see almost the exact same thing happening at Pixar. No, definitely. And and, and see, I, I realized that this was going to be a big episode, especially if we started to talk about Pixar. But you can't not. Because part of... And they never said it once on this little documentary. Again, it's like a triple word score story or something like this. This thing should have been three times longer. <laughs> they never mentioned the P word once. But that was a big influence in shutting down Disney feature animation. Pixar was an outside company that had a contract with Disney to distribute. And they split the money. Pixar got, I'm assuming, half. And Disney got half. And they, you know, they each shared half with the exhibitors. And, you know, it's not 50, 50, 50, 50 or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? Pixar, all they did were these movies. You know what I mean? Maybe they had a commercial contract on the side or maybe they were going to do sh little shorts or whatever. But it was the be all end all of this company. You know, a bunch of people who were hungry, like we were talking about with Mr. T being hungry, seeing, or sorry, uh, Clubber Lang seeing Rocky Balboa <laughs> and and being hungry and wanting what he had and Rocky had it. And it's like, eh, you know, I'm going to be on the Muppet show. And Pixar put out these movies that were groundbreaking and built on so much life and humor and sweat and talent and imagination and creativity and luck. I mean, luck has got to be a factor in there too. Just the fact that these people were in the right place in the right time and that they got the computers to do what they wanted to do and that it looked different than anything that we'd ever had and they had engaging stories and for at least three of the movies there were toy lines that were successfully attached and so they were competing with Disney and until Disney bought Pixar and made it a Disney company and had control over it they had nobody to answer to Pixar except for themselves you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how these Disney animators sounded like in the, the, the Silly Dreamer thing. They they talked about and th that there were so many ch chances for them to be specific and they were always vague. <laughs> and I always felt like, well, that's because they don't want lawsuits from Disney. Probably, yeah. But they were talking about a movie and I assumed it was Beauty and the Beast. And he said that there was a sequence that wasn't quite right. And we all just worked you know, over time, over time, over time until we got it right. Because we knew that 20 years from now, people would look at that movie and see, oh, hey, that, that moment right there wasn't right. These movies last forever. They knew that because they worked for a company whose legacy was these movies last forever. Right. You know, I, I, I Pixar was totally that way. And, you know, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe Pixar is still that way. But once they were owned by a parent company, which was Buena Vista, and Pixar started being told what to do. And first of all, we need way more of what you guys are doing. You started getting that exact same problem. Let's split the teams. The team that made Monsters, Inc., why don't we split a bunch of those guys and each of you can head your own department and each of you will make a movie. I, I don't know. Maybe that's that, that was the first problem is you and I go off to make our own podcasts and the dynamic that you and I had being in the same room, working together, trying to one-up each other or interrupt each other, mostly me interrupting you, <laughs> is gone. And that was a big part of the charm of our show. Right. Yeah, you dilute what you have immediately. I mean, there's no way to not dilute it. Even if you bring in a bunch of new people to fill in the roles of the people that have been split off. But These the people are new. They don't know the deal. They have to learn it. Uh, you know, and if you're bringing in that many new people, you know, it's not a slow, steady growth. It's, a, oh, let's split it in half right now instead of, okay, let's start hiring extra people and then eventually we'll split off a team five years from now or something like that after all these people are trained up and ready to go. Or, you know, it's just, just that was their second problem was time. We We want more from you guys, but we want it now. We want it really soon. And I don't know how long Toy Story took to make, except for that Toy Story came out in 95 and Bugs Life came out in 98. 
so I think that tells you something right there that it took that long before the follow-up. And Toy Story made so much money that it can't have been money that prevented them from having another movie the next year or the year after that. It's just these guys had a process. And I guess their attitude was, you know, we will sell no wine before it's time. And now we've got Disney saying we want more of these. We've got Disney saying we want them faster. And now Disney is saying we want more, we want more of sequels of stuff that has been successful. We like that you guys have taken risks up to this point, but now is not the time for risk. Let's do what we know works. Yeah, because they're saying now let's cash in on what we've built. They're just, you know, it's basically giving up. It's like Van Halen in 1996 or 7 or so fell apart. And one of the reasons why is uh, they decided to put out a Greatest Hits album. And Sammy Hagar was like, Greatest Hits album? That's what you put out when you don't make new songs. We're not a done band here. We're not over with. We're not going to put out a Greatest Hits album. And the other guys are like, no, let's cash in on what we've already done. And eventually they just fell apart and they didn't have a... I don't know if they ever had another... They, they, they wound they up the losing extreme. Sammy Hagar and getting that guy from Extreme as their lead singer. You know, they went into like the worst period. But, um, but see, yeah, the uh, Greatest Hits is a no-brainer. Everybody does the greatest hits. You'd be crazy not to. That's free money. <laughs> you have already put out all these songs. People who don't know your band will be surprised by how many of these songs that they know. See, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it did do damage to the band, and you're well, right. They fell but apart. I just I can't imagine that being but a, it's cashing in on the work that you do instead of continuing to do new great work. Yeah, but they didn't record this greatest hits thing. They couldn't have had anything to do with the <laughs> greatest true. hits album. And I'm not saying that that's not part of it. It's just it's the I I, I got to err on the side of Disney on this one <laughs> with the greatest hits because it's basically just like Disney saying, "Well, we're not going to put Cars out on DVD." And you're like, "Well, of course you will." What? That's where most of our money comes from. It's like, no, no, we're not going to do it. But yeah, that's, I would just say that is more of what, oh, okay, we'll do, we'll go this. It's like them doing an acoustic version of all their songs that they've already put out and then doing, hey, let's do a big band version now okay. of all our greatest songs. We've gotten that's all what, of Van Halen in a room. They've gotten all their music, their instruments all tuned and they're all ready. But instead of doing new music, yes, we'll we're going to do different album. versions of our uh, our, our hits yeah. in the past. Instead of creating we're something do new, eighty six version of "Don't Stand So Close to Me Now." Instead of doing which new is songs. so much better than the eighty two version. And yes, it's, it's, you are totally right on that. That's and I what these thought of are that. now. They're they're not doing anything new. They're not. I mean, they do have some movies out that they say are coming and that are going to be, uh, and hopefully. They still have it. You know, when The Good Dinosaur comes out, well, or yes, we should. movie set in human mind, does that have a, a it's title? It's called Inside Out. Inside Out, okay. If Inside Out comes around uh, and those are good, then, hey, maybe things haven't completely fallen apart. Well, see, okay, this is 2014 we're recording this in. And this is the first Pixar-less year since... I think that there was a space in between... <laughs> Monsters and Nemo that was the last time there was a year without a Pixar movie but I could be wrong there, maybe there was a year in between Incredibles and Cars yeah but, it's, it was somewhere around there because I remember one year after they had the uh, feature animation Oscar that they didn't have a, a movie that was it was like a year and a half instead of just a year that, that was in between the two films I think maybe the year Spirited Away one yeah but okay, so this you know, is that may have been Monsters and Nemo because there was. Uh, I know that Monsters came out in the uh, Thanksgiving season, and Nemo came out in summer. So it may have been that. Okay. But uh, this summer, the Good Dinosaur was set to come out, directed by Bob Peterson, and something happened. And I don't know if we'll ever entirely know what the deal was. 
But first off, Bob Peterson was fired from the project. And uh, Pixar was really adamant that, you know, that, that it was creative. You know, that, hey, we love Bob Peterson and uh, we, you know, we'll continue to work with Bob Peterson. There's nothing acrimonious about it. But then almost immediately after it said, the last dinosaur, the good dinosaur, has been postponed a year. So it'll be 2015 when that comes out. And another strange thing was, though, that the next one, Inside Out, has been postponed a year. And Finding Dory, the sequel to Finding Nemo, has been postponed a year. And to me, that makes no sense because, again, Pixar is split up into these little groups. The people working on Inside Out are not the people working on Good Dinosaur. So there may be something else going on there. I, I, I don't know. Well, I'm sure they have a release, you know, they can't just, well, this one's postponed a year, but the other one's still coming out at the same time, so now they will compete against each other. They can't have them do that. They don't want to have them coming out at the same time, so if they're going to push one back a year, they'll probably have to push their whole schedule back. I, I, I hear you, but they could have just... Moved one of them up? Yeah, or Only if it's ready, they had be been talking do about doing two Pixar movies a year, and we were going to do one in the summer and one in the fall. They could have uh, tried that, or they could. I, I don't know. Maybe I. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's better that they bump them all, but we don't know exactly what was wrong with Good Dinosaur. I know a guy who works for Buena Vista, and he told me that Bob Peterson was told to make a bunch of changes, and he said no. Oh, I've been with this company all these years. This is my vision, and I'm going to stick with it. And they said, okay, you're fired. Which Lasseter has done before uh, with other directors. I just, I don't know if that's the case with this one or we'll ever find out what the case is because these people want to continue to have jobs and so they don't right. tell tales out of school, which is, again, one of the reasons I think that this documentary was so short. And there were probably a bunch of people that they talked to that said, I, I'm not going to appear on the documentary. I'm pissed off. But, you know, hopefully one day I can work for them again and they'll know who talked to you and who didn't. Oh, gosh, that sounded Third Reich, didn't it? <laughs> um, I don't know. On the, on the, the thing with The Good Dinosaur was it's a story about a world, an Earth, where the dinosaurs were never destroyed by the comet or the asteroid, by the Fox Animation Ice Age that uh, killed the dinosaurs and... It was basically pitched as a boy and his dinosaur movie. I think we talked about that months and months and months ago before it was canceled or postponed. And that sounds great to me. I mean, it could go any number of directions. But when I hear a boy and his dinosaur, I instantly think of like a connection between a boy and his dog and the love between them and, you know, getting all choked up seeing whatever happens to split them up or to, you know, put one of them in danger or just the loyalty of this, this dog. And who knows it, maybe it's totally not that we'll see. We had the crudes in 2013, which is caveman bullshit. Sorry. And we had walking with dinosaurs 3d, which is photo realistic dinosaur bullshit. Yeah. I heard it was absolutely terrible. My wife and kids went and saw that while we were at new media expo. They got to see it for free, and my wife thought it was too expensive. And it, it's very possible that they saw that the, these two movies that are similar-ish, and they said, you know, maybe it's better if we make these changes, or maybe it's better if we delay, or whatever the deal is. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've complained till the cows come home about Newt being canceled instead of postponed, or whatever. There's an alternate reality where Newt... You know, one best animated feature that year. I've always wondered if that was the, you know, if Rio was the reason that Newt was uh, canceled. Axed. Yeah, Axed. and I, I think it was. It was a very similar premise. Yeah, but who cares? <laughs> I mean, seriously, the the fact that Walking with Dinosaurs came out, let's say six months before Good Dinosaur, I don't know that that's going to matter. If there's one that's good and one that's bad. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe you get two Snow White 
live action movies in the same summer and one is going to be a failure and one is going to be a hit. But we also grew up in a, an era where Deep Impact and Armageddon made buttloads of money. Yeah. The same summer. Not always that way. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, a year from now, when Good Dinosaur comes out, all this may be forgotten because a year is nothing. Once you get to be our age, a year is nothing. The three years in between the Star Wars prequels were nothing. They were a blink. But as a kid, you know, a year was so, so, so long. To postpone a movie just, you know, a mere 12 months is not... Financially, it doesn't matter. And historically, it's not going to matter. If they're taking an extra year to fix things, to make the movie better, to... There's a couple moments that are soft, and we just couldn't release the movie in June without leaving those moments in. And maybe maybe Lasseter makes these decisions himself. Maybe somebody that's over Lasseter makes these decisions. But if he sat us down and said, hey, guys, I hear what you're saying. It's all wrong, but I hear what you're saying. And the good dinosaur that you will see next year will be so much better than the good dinosaur that you would have seen this year. Because it, these things just, they, if they're rushed, you feel that they're rushed. If things don't work, you can't just snap your fingers and make them work. You have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, let's do a new sequence. Maybe insert a character. And we can't just wholesale insert this character. We've got to plant him earlier in the movie and all that thing to fix. I don't know. He could convince us that uh, the year is, is totally worth it. For example, the Star Wars sequel got postponed six months. If it's going to make that Star Wars sequel better, postpone it a year. Postpone it two years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because right now, two years seems like a long time. But ten years from now, it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I just... Uh, Star Wars movies, Pixar movies, and Disney movies are the kind of movies that last forever. There are others that you forget about. You don't remember... Grown ups to ten years from now, except for as maybe you know a punchline of a joke like, oh yeah, Mannequin Two on the move, Gremlins Two the new batch, you know those kind of things, but uh, you don't remember them for that. But certain movies you remember, you own, you've watched them again and again and again, and so yeah, sometimes it's just better to make sure that they're good. I hope that you know we we talked about the the parallel between this. I hope that. Pixar is not in that death spiral. Um, and 10 years from now, it'll be like Disney. You know, who would have thought in 1994 that 10 years later, Disney's feature animation would be shut down completely. They'd be done with it. And it would take Lasseter being bought out by Disney and put in charge of of all of Disney's feature animation just to get another 2D animation picture made at all. Um, you know, who would, have, who would have ever guessed the year that Lion King came out that there was only 10 years left of uh, 2D animation before it would be gone? But at the same time, if you sat somebody down in 94 and said, here's a list of the Disney animated features that are going to come in the next 10 years, and four minutes later you're still talking... <laughs> They, that that person would not have believed that either. And, you know, Pixar hasn't... We haven't seen that kind of output from Pixar. We haven't seen... True. ...that kind of stress. Although, I don't know, we don't see what goes into them. All I know is that these movies are incredibly expensive to make. And even so, they're not as expensive as hand-drawn animation. And so... I don't know what the solution is. Somebody somewhere said Disney feature animation was going to do a, an animated movie in the same style as Paper Man, which was hand drawn on a computer screen and computer animated. And it looked unlike anything you and I had ever seen before. And so if that works, it'll be sort of a hybrid and it, it maybe it will feel and look like the old stuff. I don't know. I we talked about that Mickey Mouse cartoon, the 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 one that's the Disney Channel thing. I imagine it's made in a similar way, hand drawn but with a stylus or whatever on a screen and animated in whatever the 
ultra expensive version of flash animation is. <laughs> Unless we can come up with a cheap way to do it, then every single one of them has to be a huge hit. I, I but you and I both feel really bad about Princess and the Frog because it's not a bad movie. Yeah, it's not it a bad movie. It just cost so much money that and they it put was, all of their hopes on it. I actually just saw it the other day. The kids put it on again, and I was watching it, and it's amazing how gorgeous that movie is. It is really, really beautiful, and it's just a shame as you watch it to know, well, this is it. It's over. There's no more of these. This was the top of the mountain, and then there was a cliff. But yeah, I, I just hope that Pixar is not heading into the same thing and i hope that someday we'll see 2d again it seems like there's got to be a way because they did it before uh they talked about one of the things in the uh in that documentary that we watched dream on silly dreamer the reason why suddenly these movies cost so much to make is because the animators salaries suddenly ballooned because they saw how much money the movie brought in and they would go and say okay well i want this much money then Oh, and also they said other companies opened as as competitors and tried to get those animators, hey, come right. make movies for us. And Disney felt like, well, we have to, to keep them with us, pay them a ton of money yeah. to keep them happy. DreamWorks came along and started stealing people away and paying them more to get them to come away. And so then, you know, everybody's salaries went up when there's a competitor that's trying to steal your workforce away from you. You know, the same kind of, that kind of stuff happens in, in all sorts of places. Uh, the example I come up with is when the USFL came along and they started taking people from the NFL and paying them lots of money, drafting the draft pe choices that the NFL would draft and paying them more. Suddenly, people's salaries went up all around. And, you know, the USFL couldn't sustain it. And they fell apart and went away in like two or three years, which is kind of what DreamWorks... Uh, 2D animation did anyways. What did they do? They did uh, The Prince of Egypt, and did they ever even do anything after that? Yeah, they, they did Road to El Dorado. Okay. Which was fairly successful. But then they had, like, a Sinbad one, which was not Oh, right, successful. the Sinbad one. And I know that there's another one. They did... There. But they, they did a the direct to video time, one, too, which was Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat or something like that. Which was like a, seek, a direct to video sequel kind of thing of uh, it was, Prince yeah, another, of Egypt. A, another biblical one, but it wasn't based on Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor. Dream. Well, no, no, it was based on Joseph of and Egypt, whatever of story, comes. right? That was a direct to video one. And I, obviously, they were just following the t Disney template. Because Fox did the same thing. Don Bluth went to Fox and he made Anastasia. And they did a direct-to-video sequel to Anastasia about Bartok, the <laughs> right. bat. But their 2D animation didn't last. I don't think it even lasted as long as Disney's did. Well, no, because in 98, DreamWorks put out Ants with a Z, which was CG animation. Actually came out before Prince of Egypt. Did it? Yeah. Okay. came out in October. Prince of Egypt came out in December that same year. And uh, Ants was successful, and, and I think Prince of Egypt oh. was too, but not. DreamWorks did Spirit, the Stallion of, of the, the Cimarron. Cimarron. Yeah. Matt Damon is the voice of a voice. <laughs> but, the, yeah, the, the, the CG thing, I, this is going to sound really ignorant, but it's easier. You You... You get the motion and the character down or whatever, and he's always going to be there. You know what I mean? It's like building a set. Right. And the set's always going to be there. Whereas hand-drawn animation is every time you build a set, you have to build it again. And another set. And another set. Luckily, yeah. drawing a character doesn't take as long as building a set. Right, but <laughs> making a character talk or sing or dance takes as long as building a set. And then you have to color that character. And you have to do the effects around the character. And his shadows. Yeah, it seems to me like there's got to be a way. And I, I'm sure pe people use it all the time because it's not like 2D animation has gone away. There's dozens and dozens of cartoons on TV every day that are 2D animated cartoons. 
there's got to be there must be ways that they uh, you know use computers to assist in it if it maybe it's drawing it on the trackpad with the little pen or you know scanning it in and the computer fills in the gaps from you know one drawing to another so you only have to do the key drawings of you know your foot down and the foot's up all the way kind of a thing and you know that kind of stuff I, I think that stuff exists and they do those things so you know I think that there's ways to make it cheaper if they just believed in it enough to to give it a shot you know it sometimes makes me a little sad that snow queen sorry frozen and uh tangled ta oh tangled that's what it was called i was i was going to say rapunzel sorry i forgot that the, the movies were called something completely stupid but uh yeah it, sometimes it makes me sad that those weren't 2d animated films well especially tangled I mean, they brought Don Hahn on to make them look like the Disney Renaissance 2D animated films, the, or the, at least the characters. I mean, Rapunzel looks like a character designed by the guy who designed Ariel and Belle. And, and yeah, it, it, it it's such a shame. It's a great movie. I just saw Tangled again, for only the second time, last week. And, you know, oh, it was wonderful. But a little part of me just wishes that it were the other. And I don't know why that is. I, well, because I have nostalgia for hand-drawn animation. Right. I don't have nostalgia for CG animation. In fact, I have contempt for CG animation, which sucks because Toy Story is awesome. You know, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, Up, those are awesome movies. I just, that didn't exist when I was a child. That didn't exist in my grandparents' day. Yeah. There, there was something so neat about knowing that the movie I was going to see came out before my dad was alive. You know, that kind of stuff. I, I That boggles my mind that it's the same movie and we're both going to see it at different points of our lives because it's timeless and almost no movies are that. Nowadays, I guess maybe once a year, you'll get an old movie re-released. For a little while there, when the 3D boom was going on, you'd get more. But even then, like my cousin and I went and saw Raiders of the Lost Ark in IMAX. And it played for one week as a promotional tool for the Blu-ray release of the Indiana Jones Quadrology. To see it, Raiders in IMAX was amazing. It was so cool. And there were a couple of moments where he's like, they added that. They added that part, right? Those people, fall, you know, like when the car goes <laughs> off the cliff, he's like, that was CG, right? And I was like, no, it's always looked like that. That's uh, just amazing. Yeah, that is. Uh, we've gone for a really long time on this subject. I didn't mean for it to be this long. No, but we had that derailment in the middle, and I feel like we should address that again. But I... I don't know. I'm sure we'll address it again and again as the year goes on, so we can uh, we can let it go, let it go. That perfect girl is gone. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go ahead and call it a night right now. Um, thanks for listening, everybody, to the show. And we'll be back with more. That gets my go next week. Oh, really? Next week? That's the idea, anyways. So this this light of ambition in your eyes. I'm not sure I like it. <laughs> it's not ambition, it's insanity. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under Comrader Commons, have a decent, non commercial, no deliveries, 3.0 license. But that will be our little secret. You just about vomited all over the desk, didn't you? No, it's just a bubbly that was, belchy. That was beyond just bubbly belchy. I could hear the chunks hitting the back of your teeth. Ew. <laughs> I'm going to do a chunky burp, too. <sighs> you can do better than that. I could, but, yeah, I can feel the chunks wanting to come up from it, though. Okay.